Hello, I'm Father Louis Skurdy with Friends of the Word. We thank you for joining us for the weekday homily as well as this, the homily of the week, which is Sunday. And this is the 33rd Sunday of Ordinary Time, pretty much coming down to the wire. Next week, we celebrate Christ the King and ends the liturgical year. So we thank you for joining us this past year, and we'd like to invite you to pass this on to your family and friends. And if you'd like to be on our email list, contact me at Father Lou, that's F-R, Father Lou, Skirty, at Hotmail.com. Thank you, and God bless you. Pass the word, and keep it alive and well. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. <clears throat> Jesus told his disciples this parable. A man was going on a journey, called in his servants, and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately, the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made five more. Likewise, the one who received two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing an additional five. The master said, you gave me five talents. See, I have made more, he said to the master. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come and share my master's joy. Then the one who had received two talents came forward and said, master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibility. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a demanding man, harvesting where you did not plant, gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear, I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is, back. His master said to him in reply, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I do not plant and gather where I do not scatter. Should you not then have put my money in the bank so then I could have it back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given until he grows rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And throw this useless servant into the darkness outside where he will be wailing and grinding his teeth. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget it's a parable, so applicable as we see fit. And that's going to be important because it seems kind of weird that the guy who got one buried it and he was punished for that. Let me tell you about burying your money. First of all, then, it was not uncommon for people to have a field and bury treasures in their field so they knew and only they knew where the treasure was. So it's not unusual that he buried his money. But when I was a kid, I lived right around the corner from my grandmother. Okay? And I would go there pretty much every day after school and study and hang out. And on Saturdays, I was there. My buddies lived on Fifth Street, so I was there outside playing. And every now and then, I'd get a little something from my grandmother to go into the store or doing a favor or maybe painting something. And she'd give me money. Now, they had an attic in their house that went upstairs, of course, but the, the step at the attic, the first step at the attic, was a drawer. Then you pull that drawer open, 
and you push it back, of course, that was a secret drawer. It was my drawer. It was my secret stash. And I had a little white, excuse me, a little wooden box that I still have with a little lock on it that kept any money I had went in there. Didn't put it in the bank because I was a kid. Who knew banks? Who knew what banks would do with their money, you know? So I would put my money in there and I would store it away. And then an occasion came around, Christmas, a gift. I always had money, usually in pennies and nickels and dimes, but I had money to bring to the bank and, and then get cash and do my spending. So let's not be too harsh on the guy who buried his money. He put it where he knew it was. He didn't gain interest, like I didn't get any, gain any interest, but there was a sense of security. But that's not what the parable is all about. The parable, I think it, it plays into the first reading from the book of Proverbs very well. I think it has something to do with social responsibility. And I think that's something applicable to us, no matter where we are, whatever, whatever time and season it is. First of all, the concept of talent as something that indicates an accomplishment in a, in a person. Talent came from a, a measure of weight. And the weight was like 75 to 100 pounds. And talents eventually became associated with amounts of money. So when we hear that he gave five talents, the master gave five talents and three talents and one talent, he gave a bundle. He gave like a year's salary to the first guy. A lot of money, maybe several thousand dollars. It's a parable, don't, go, don't get too excited about it. So he gives this, he invests this in this man, and this man goes off and does something considering he doubled his, his investment, very wise. And the same thing with the second. But the third sought security. But now, if we look at the woman that's being described in the book of Proverbs, which is sort of a, a, a mirror of this reading, it's a relationship reading, what, what is she doing? She's going about her business, and it, it, it might seem chauvinistic because it's praising a woman for being a good and diligent housewife and keeping the kids dressed and fed and, and all that good stuff. It's not. It's, it's meant to have us look at the creativity with which this woman ran her household. The creativity involving everybody got fed, everybody got dressed, and she had money for the poor, and she had money for charity. So she's balancing her life, and she's not being like, you know, Ozzie and Harriet kind of woman. She's being a very practical woman in the, in the book of Proverbs. And the whole book of Proverbs is, is a series of wisdom literature that is created, was created to give us an appreciation of how to live the life that we're living, but with integrity. And in, in their perspective, in, in integrity and relationship to the covenant, well, our lives are called to do the same thing. We're called to live our lives with integrity to the covenant that we have with Jesus Christ. So no longer counting our evaluation of abilities with numbers of talent, but look at what we, we have to evaluate. What are the lives that we have? And, and how can we prepare? That second reading in, in Thessalonians is a reading toward the end. But let's catch that up. It's, the reading for Thessalonians is describing Paul's pre preparation for the end times and the return of Christ. And it's liturgically here because this is practically the last Sunday of the liturgical year. So the readings are about the end times. But so is the book of Proverbs, and so is the book of Talents and, and that we hear about in Jesus' gospel today. About the end times, about getting ready for the end. And maybe if we look at the book of Proverbs and we, and we look at the, hear the gospel, we realize, wait a minute, forget getting ready for the end times. Get ready right now. Be aware now of what our responsibility to the covenant of Jesus Christ is. Be responsible now. Forget about the end times. They'll come when they come. And, and, and the Gospels have already told us, and Paul reiterates it, Jesus is going to return like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when he's coming. So we can't get ready for the end when Jesus will return in glory. You can't even get ready. We can't even get ready for our own deaths. We don't know when they're happening. We have no schedule. We're not, we're not de determinant that our particular age will we'll end our life at this, this particular time and date. 
We don't have that. So the Gospels today and, and the readings today are calling us, I think, to evaluate our present day, our present use of who we are, the use of our talents, our wisdom, our treasure, our time, who we are, using them properly in getting ready for, for Christ at the end of time. Yes, but getting ready for Christ today that we meet daily. How do we do that? Well, two women come to mind, St. Teresa of Lisieux, and she, she made her fame by doing things in a simple way. Her whole theology was doing things in a simple way to give glory to God. You don't know anything fantastic about Teresa of Lisieux through her actions while she was alive. The miracles that came after her death, another story. But we don't, what do we know about her? She was a simple nun in Lisieux in a convent in France. But in her writings, the journey of a soul, the, 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 the reflections of a soul that she wrote down, she often spoke about giving glory to God in simple ways, in obeying the rule of the convent, in cleaning, in doing dusting, in, in doing practical things. When, when somebody broke something, she would be first to clean it up. And he said, well, you're a little nuts there. No, but she, she's giving glory to God in ways that does not get a lot of attention. It looks like she's just being, like the woman in the book of Proverbs, a practical woman. And she's not blaming, you did this, you should clean up that. No, she's just going about her business and the call to the Carmel, the convent in which she lived, the call to, to live the simple, simple, simple life in little ways. How, how, how much of an opportunity do we all have to live our lives in union with Christ doing simple things. And we in New Jersey also have another example of that. Blessed Miriam Teresa Demjanovic, who was just beatified in October, October 4th, at the cathedral in Newark. And reading her life, again, she was one who, who focused on perfection in little things. She, she focused on doing things in, in a way that was balanced. And the book that she, she again, eventually she, that gets published of her work is called The Greater Perfection. Balance and simple things. And everything she did, she did well. Maybe a little bit of a perfectionist, but she did well. We, I mean, of course, she was a, pretty much a contemporary in the last century. She... We have records of her in school. We have records of her being on, on the yearbook committee. We have records of her going to her prom. We, we have all those stories because she was pretty much a well-known 20th, 20th century woman. And everybody afterwards says, yeah, she did it. Yeah, she was really, you, you want something? Go to Treat. Treat was her nickname, uh, Teresa, Teresa Demjanovic. Her nickname was Treat. You want something done well, go to Treat. But they didn't know they were talking about a saint. They didn't, she's not a saint yet, she's beatified. But they didn't know she was, they were talking about someone who was saintly. She was just a nice guy, girl. And she hung out. She was an athlete. She was an artist. She, she drove people crazy with her perfectionism, by the way. Not everybody, but a lot of people you hear in the writings, oh, you know, she always did everything so good. She ever did everything so well. But then you have the root. The, the, the other kind of uh, notations from, you know, when I was sick, she came to my room, she took care of me all night, she fluffed my pillow, she gave me th something to eat and something to drink while she was in the convent. So she, she did it in a simple way, not so she gets noticed, not so she gets extra credit, not that, that she's, she's building up her, 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 her fortune for Christ's return and glory. She did it here and now. Simple. Simple way, aiming toward her greater perfection. So the scriptures have, have a good practicality that we can adapt. That if we give all we have, according to the gospel today, we gain all. If we give a little, we gain a little. If we give nothing, you get nothing back. So these two examples of, well, maybe three. The woman in the parable, uh, the book of Proverbs. The, the woman, uh, Teresa of Lisieux. The woman, Miriam Trays, three people who did what they did and did it well, not so they would get gain, but in that simplicity of accomplishing, they're on the road for sainthood because of their example to us in our own homes. 
whether you're dusting or cleaning or driving to or from work, whether you're in relationship with your, your, your colleagues at work or at the, in the lunchroom or in class, call to invest. Invest in what we do as Christians. See, because Jesus has given us the example of investing with the three, power, three uh, servants, but we have a great treasure. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We have a relationship with the Son of God. We're called to be members of his body. Great investment that God has in us. Just like the the master had an investment in his servants and he trusted them, God the Father invests in us to do his son's will, to follow the example, to be awake, as, as Paul says, and vigilant to be accountable, and to be responsible as Christians. Recently, I had an interview with a young man who's an American now, born and raised in Albania. And his family came here when they were still under communist rule. And he said he does remember, and even when he goes back, he's, he, 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 it's all, it all comes back to him, he does remember how the church was the center of the community in his particular town, how everything happened through the church and with the church, whether it was a party or an event or, 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 or help. Everybody, the church ran it all, and the people, the people who are the church ran it all. He says, but at times he goes back recently, and his atheism is, is rampant. The, the, the community is no longer as tight as it was when he was there, when his parents came over. And, and the young people especially, and he identified with them, he's, he himself is 26, the young people especially don't have the faith. Uh, hello? L- look at our own country. Look at our own country. And, and I think, well, those who have the faith Are we investing our faith enough in our world? Are we truly investing, as Christ comments on on the servants in the parable, do we really invest what we have, our faith in Jesus Christ, in the world? Do people look at the Christian, the Roman Catholics today, and say, wow, look what they're doing. Oh, do something wrong, and you're all over the front page. But... How about us giving an example of doing what is Christ-like? Today I noticed there's a beautiful collection going on for Thanksgiving in in our parish center, and that goes on all year. As you guys know, here at the parish, there's always something going on. It's nice, but it's kind of secure that you bring your food here and you leave it there and you leave it to somebody else to bring it down to Eva's kitchen or or distribute it. I'm not saying I'm not blaming. I'm not being mean because I contributed to it myself. But you see what what we lack there? We lack visibility. Do something wrong. It's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. It's all over the world immediately. Do something good like that, like feeding the hungry, and nobody knows about it. We have to invest in our faith. We have to not bury it in the ground. We have to promote it. We are the evangelizers of the 21st century. So people are are comfortable, maybe, and whether it's our youth or or right across the board as far as the age goes, they're comfortable with atheism. They're comfortable with agnosticism. They're comfortable, you know what I think it all is? It's, it's, you know, they lack lack of of visibility, lack of witness. So they'll roll. They'll, They'll go with what's comfortable in their own lives. And you know what? We can look at the world and we can see the growth of social responsibility in the world. We're supposed to be in front. We're supposed to be the people who know the Son of God and who incorporate the Son of God into our lives and into our values. So therefore, everyone should look at the Christian and say, Ooh, look how they love one another and respect each other and read to the poor and give food to the hungry and, and clothing to the naked and go out and serve. Look at that. It's, it's, it's in the public eye. Not so much. So it's us who might be investing our faith in a hole in the ground. And when Jesus comes back, boy, is he going to be upset. 
If that's, if that's what he, he did for us, and we get our faith and we bury it and we don't share it, it's our responsibility to look at social mechanisms in the world. And, and there are strong social activist groups going on in the world, fighting for women's rights, fighting for justice, fighting for a fair wage, fighting for, for fair economy. And don't let the world take that away from you and me. We have to be there. The Christian has to be fighting for just wage. The Christian has to be in the forefront fighting for a just economy. The, the Christian has to be in, in the forefront fighting for justice, teaching by example, by doing justice. And see, if we remove Christ from all of that good stuff, then what pours in its place? The materialism and atheism. We, we, and humanism. We could be nice people. Well, Jesus didn't come so we could be nice people. Jesus came so that we could get to heaven. Jesus gave his life, not so you, you, and, you and I could be nice to each other. There's a section in, I don't know um, the exact quote, there's a section in the book of Apoc Apocalypse in which Jesus comes back and he says, for those of you who were like lukewarm, I vomited you from my mouth. Want Jesus to say that about you? Being lukewarm Catholics? We have to be people who know what social responsibility is. And as Pope Francis recently said, inequality is the root of all social evil. And if we just walk by and allow inequality to exist in the world around us and ignore our Catholic Christian responsibility to fight for justice, to do what is ethical, even in, even in secular literature, social responsibility is a theory informed by ethical belief systems which propose that an individual organization have examples and obligations to act to benefit society at large. That's the gospel in miniature, isn't it? See these Christians, how they love one another. It's our obligation, I think, to invest our faith in the world, to let people know how we believe and what we do with that belief. Quoting Francis, again, the joy of the gospel, one of his uh, most recent uh, letters. The need to resolve the structural causes of poverty cannot be delayed as long as the problem of the poor are not radically resolved by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets and financial speculation and by attacking the structural causes of inequality, no solution will be found for the world's problems or, for that matter, to any problems. Inequality is the root of all social ills. What does that have to do with Christianity? Everything. What does that have to do with your coming to Mass today? Everything. Because we are free enough to act on our faith. And yes, I know, I know the media as well as you know the media, and who in, in this town doesn't want to put up a Christmas tree because I don't believe in God and you're going to hurt the atheists. Who don't put a cross there because I don't believe in God and you're going to hurt the agnostics. Fight for what you believe in. And we're not fighting for just putting up a crucifix or putting up a nativity set. We're fighting for justice. We're fighting for, for a balance in society. Go back to that woman in Proverbs. Balanced. Everything was taken care of. Her kids weren't starving so she can go give money to the poor. She took care of the kids. She took care of the poor. She took care of the household responsibilities. And that's why that section they sang about her at the, at the gate. Because, because in those days, the men s sat at the gate and they talked about each other's philosophies. So there, her name comes up in conversation and they must have said, Oy vey, your wife is some hot number. She does everything and she does it right. That's not something that gets vomited out of the mouth of Jesus. That's a challenge to us to invest our faith in the world. We have it. Don't leave it here. Don't leave it here. It belongs out there.